one, check two, mic check one, mic check two. Check one, check two, mic check one, cool.
Great. Thank you, Hannah. It's great. Yeah. Great to see you. Okay.
Thank you for congratulations. Ready? I'm ready. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. There we go. Now I'm ready. I've got to get the locks all over. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Greetings. Um, my name is uh, Clifton Oyamot, and I'm the chair of the psychology department. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the annual Alan Kasdan Endowed Lecture. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time and braving the rains to join us today. I think this is the first time we've had it in person for like three years, and we've been doing it all along. And Jen, Jen uh, Dr. Greg has been incredible in adapting to all of the changes and still holding this wonderful event. But I think this is the first time in three years. Um, this annual lecture is supported by a generous endowment from Alan E. Kasdan, PhD, in grateful acknowledgement of the impact that the faculty in psychology has had on his career, and no doubt on the careers of many others. Kasdan is Sterling Professor of Psychology and Child Psychiatry at Yale University, and an alumnus of the SJSU Psychology Department, 1967. So each year, through this endowment, we are able to invite a distinguished and influential speaker to inspire a new generation of psychologists and shape the future of our field and our society. In recent years, we have had distinguished scientists speak on topics such as mental health and well-being, autism and neuroscience, psychology and technology, among others. And I misspoke. We actually had this in person last year. So this is our second in person. Um, and I'm very excited that this year's speaker is Dr. Jeannie Sai. So at this point, I'm going to hand the mic over to Dr. Jen, Jen Gregg, who is our faculty Kasdan event coordinator, and she will introduce this year's speaker. Hi. So I am extremely just stoked to introduce this year's speaker um you know we do this talk every year we try to bring in a bunch of different people doing a bunch of different types of work and this year's speaker is just extraordinary um so i'm going to read her bio because she's so amazing but i'm also going to say she's also just a really super nice person so i think that should go first um Jeannie Sai is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Stanford and director of the Stanford Culture and Emotion Lab. She earned her BA in psychology at Stanford and then her PhD in clinical psychology at UC Berkeley. After doing her clinical internship and postdoc at UCSF in minority mental health, she was an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota from 1997 to 2000, where, by the way, she met our chair, who was a student there at the time. Um, she then joined the faculty at Stanford in 2000. And she has more awards than I could possibly list. So I'm not going to list them all. Um, she wouldn't even get a chance to talk if I was just going to list all of her awards. But I will say she is the Yumi and Yasunori Kaneko Family University Fellow in undergraduate education at Stanford. And this may or may not be meaningful to you, but she is a fellow at all of these organizations in psychology, which is a huge deal. She's a fellow at the Association for Psychological Science, a fellow at the American Psychological Association, a fellow at the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, and a fellow at the Society for Experimental Social Psychology, which is a huge deal. Also, I think particularly relevant for today and here at San Jose State, she has won the Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching, not just once, but twice at Stanford. So I could have very high expectations because she will probably blow them away. Dr. Sai. Oh, thank you. I hate it when people talk about the Distinguished Teaching Award because now your expectations are quite high. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen, Dr. Greg, um, for that introduction. One of the best things about doing this thing, being a professor, is teaching and meeting so many different students, but also meeting so many amazing faculty over the long haul, you know, I, um, after decades and decades. I just got back from the Society for Personality and Social Psychology Conference. I don't know if any of you were there. 
but it's like a longitudinal study. It's like every year we see each other and you sort of get, you know, you, you get to learn about the research and how it's evolved over time, but also you get to learn about people and how they're doing and what their lives are like. So it's just like such a great profession and I'm just so honored to be here. So thank you so much for this opportunity to tell you about the work that I've been doing ever since I was a graduate student, but actually it started when I was an undergrad. So to all of you undergrads who are in the audience, so many of the things that you're wondering about and the questions that you're asking, you know, in your classes can really make a difference in a field and, and um, you might decide to pursue them. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how this work comes from sort of my experiences with the hope that you will do the same and think about your experiences. And I'm gonna tell you about, about the work that we've been doing over 30 years, but I hope that I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna learn just as much from you um, based on the different questions that you ask. So please feel free to stop me as I start talking. Um, if there are any clarification questions, if you ask a really deep question, I might ask you to wait and we'll talk about it um, at the end of the talk. But I know what I'm gonna say, I've said it a million times, so it's much more interesting for us to make this more of a dialogue and a conversation. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, um, so as I said, I started actually being interested in culture um, when I was an undergrad at Stanford. Um, it, that was at a time, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, and um, there was kind of this resurgence of interest in Asian American identity. And it really, well, it really wasn't until I got to Stanford that I started understanding that a lot of my ex experiences, which I thought were kind of idiosyncratic to my family, were really more cultural because suddenly I was meeting other Asian Americans from all over the United States primarily first and second generations, um, so who had similar experiences. And I kind of had this aha movement. And at the same time, you know, um, Amy Tan wrote the Joy Luck Club. And, and again, there was kind of this resurgence of interest that made me really start thinking about culture and how culture might shape human behavior. Um, but at that time, there actually wasn't very much in psychology about culture. I, you've probably learned in your psych one classes about how psychology is weird, you know, based on sort of Western educated, industrial rich and democratic samples. And that's just true of the theories. It was even more true then than it is now. Um, so that a field that's supposed to be about human behaviors was really based on 15% of the world population, eight to 15% of the world population. So this is why I wanna say that you can make a difference in a field because part of the reason why we have at least a, a, a better understanding of how culture influences human behavior, although there's, you know, we have a, a long way to go, is because different people entered the field who came from different backgrounds, uh, non-weird backgrounds. But when I entered, there wasn't that much. And um, so as an undergrad, I was like learning about these theories of human behavior that didn't really apply to me. I mean, one of my favorites is in developmental psychology, you know, at the time it's like, oh, you individuate and you become an adult at 18 and then you leave your family and you lead your own life, you know? And as a child of Taiwanese immigrants and many of you are like, no, that doesn't happen. You're always a child. You're always a daughter. In fact, the work has just begun, you know, and now I'm living with my, my parents are living with us, and, and I really experienced that. <laughs> my work as a daughter has just begun. Um, and um, so I, this was even true of emotion. You know, there was so little work on emotion, actually, at the time. There was sort of this interest in, increasing interest in emotion, but there was nothing about, about culture. And the little work that was there was about, you know, U.S. and Japanese comparisons. And really what they thought was that um, Asian Americans and East Asians were really stoic and inscrutable. Like they, they didn't have emotions. That was sort of what people thought at the time. But I knew that that wasn't true as a child of Taiwanese immigrants. Um, I knew my family was really emotional. And so that's really what led to this all of this research that I'm going to just quickly tell you about today, looking at how culture influences our emotions and why it matters. So um, at the time, most of the work in psychology was, like I said, based on Western samples. 
Um, the few studies that looked at non-Western samples suggested that emotions were almost entirely universal. But at the same time in anthropology, and some of you may be anthropology majors, um, there were some like rich ethnographic accounts of different kinds of practices in other cultures that suggested that emotions might be entirely culturally constructed. So it was really that that was what the landscape was like, and that's how I entered. And, um, and what I wanted to do basically was take the insights from anthropology and try to apply them um, using the best methods in psychology that were emerging at the time to study emotion. So with Bob Levinson at the University of California, Berkeley, where I did my PhD, um, we basically brought people into the lab of different ethnicities, European Americans who um, were um, fourth generation in the United States, whose um, parents and grandparents were either born in the United States or a Western European country, and Chinese Americans who were first or second generation Chinese Americans whose parents were born in a Chinese cultural context. And we had them engage in a number of emotional tasks. So again, this was a time where there wasn't that much research on emotion. And so people were just starting to measure how fast their people's hearts were beating during emotional tasks and giving them self-report measures to um, measure the intensity of their emotional expressions. We recorded their faces and we coded them using these um, coding systems that looked at like minute facial muscle movements. So we did all of this, used all of these methods to look at people's emotions in the lab when they were watching emotional film clips, like sad film clips and amusing film clips, when they were reliving different emotional episodes in their lives, like think of a time when you were really angry, think of a time when you were really happy. We even brought couples, romantic couples into the lab to talk about areas of conflict in their relationship. And like I said, while we were doing those things that we were measuring their physiology, how fast their hearts were beating, how much they were sweating, and then we're, we're assessing these other measures of their emotional responses. And what was really surprising to me after doing all of that work was that contrary to what I thought and contrary to the ethnographic reports, we actually found way more similarities than differences in emotional response. Similarities in how fast people's hearts were beating during these different tasks. Similarities in how intensely they were reporting positive and negative emotions when they were watching film clips, reliving emotions, even when they were talking with their partners. Um, when we found differences, um, they were in things like how much people were smiling, um, but they were contrary to the idea that Chinese or East Asians were controlling their emotions. In fact, it sort of suggested that the European Americans were much more emotional. They were smiling much more, even during conflict. So, but really we found more similarities than differences. And so I had this like crisis, <laughs> you know, it was like, why is this the case? I know from my personal experiences that culture plays some role, but my data aren't really suggesting this. And so this is another thing I wanna say, which is, you know, if you think about going to graduate school and there are just times where, you know, things don't work out the way you think they're going to. And, you can feel down and depressed, which I did, but then it's like the beginning of a process of discovery. Because what I realized, I, and I had done the work really carefully, so I knew it wasn't that I had messed up in how I was collecting the data or analyzing the data, but really what it made me think and realize is that in all of our studies in the lab, we were really capturing what we call people's actual affect or how they were responding in the moment how they were actually feeling, right? We're measuring what happened to them in the moment when they were watching film clips, reliving emotional episodes and talking with their partners. And I started thinking with my colleagues that maybe really culture plays an even greater role in what we call ideal affect or how people ideally want to feel. And so I was thinking that in a lot of the psychology that was showing more similarities than differences, including our own work, we were primarily assessing how people were actually feeling in the moment in these kinds of carefully constructed settings that were trying to get people to feel things in a similar way, actually. And that maybe a lot of the ethnographic data and the other anthropological data that kind of suggested that there were more differences, those were really capturing kinds of practices or things that were trying to get people to want to feel a certain way. And that might be more a reflection of, of what we call ideal affect. 
So we did some studies where we then asked people, well, what is your ideal state? And you can kind of think of that for yourself. Like, what is your ideal state? Like, what is, how do you ideally want to feel? And these are some of the responses that we got. So this is a response from a typical European American student. I just want to be happy. Normally for me, that means I'd be doing something exciting. I just want to be entertained. I just like excitement. And this is in contrast to a typical response that we got from our Hong Kong Chinese students in Chinese, but translated here in English. My ideal state is to be quiet, serene, happy, and positive. So what do you notice about these different responses? So you, you can raise your hand and, uh, yes. Differences between collective and individualistic culture? Well, you are far ahead of me, so just wait, <laughs> but very good, I A just, plus. Yeah, no, yeah, well. I just gave this lecture, yeah. so it was oh, Okay, okay, great, <laughs> thank you, okay. But even more basically, what do you just notice from, from these responses? Yes. Immediately, I noticed that like both want to be in this state of happiness, but it's the way that they portray happiness. The European American student is like it's excitement, it's active, whereas uh, the Chinese student is like it's quiet, it's calm, uh, the exact opposite. Another A plus. Very good. Both participants say they want to feel happy, right? But they're defining happiness in different ways. And um, the different ways are kind of reflecting what we talk about in the emotion literature as sort of different kinds of affective styles or yeah, affective responses, um, affective states. So um, we know from a lot of research um, in psychology based on people's self-reports of their emotions, their ratings of people's emotional expressions that across a number of different cultures in lots of different languages, people organize their emotional states in terms of two dimensions, a dimension of valence that goes from pleasant to unpleasant or positive to negative, and a dimension of arousal from low to high arousal. And so that means that even though you have specific states like enthusiasm and elation, which obviously differ in, in subtle ways or not so subtle ways, what they share is that they're positive and they're stimulating. They, they're energizing, they involve increases in arousal. And similarly, you have these other states like relaxation and calm, which are equally positive, but they involve decreases in arousal. So during this talk, I'm gonna to refer to these states as high arousal positive states or HAP states, and I call them excited states, and low arousal positive states or LAP states um, or calm states. So the open-ended uh, responses that I showed you earlier are basically um, defining happiness in different affective ways, right? The first response is really talking about happiness in terms of these HAP states, these high arousal positive states. And um, the Hong Kong Chinese response is really talking about happiness in terms of these low arousal positive states. So we wanted to test this um, um, using sort of more systematic methods, more standardized methods. So we just created a measure of ideal affect and it was, it was not rocket science, honestly. We basically took existing measures um, of emotion that asked how much do you typically want to feel these different states on average? And then we said, and now how much would you ideally like to feel these states on average? Okay, and we asked about all these different states. And what we found was that across cultures, the cultures that we sampled, European Americans, Chinese Americans, and then a sample of East Asians, specifically Hong Kong Chinese, people said that they wanted to feel more positive than negative. That, that was the sim similarity across the cultural groups. Everybody wants to feel more positive than negative. We also found that people wanted to feel more positive and less negative than they actually felt. So there was a distinction between their actual affect, how much, they, how they were actually feeling and how much they, what they ideally wanted to feel. But in addition, we found some consistent cultural differences that were really similar to um, the, the differences in the responses that you saw. So here on the x-axis, you can see these high arousal positive states on the left and these low arousal positive states on the right. This is how much people ideally want to feel these states. On the y-axis is um, how much they want to feel them. It's their rating, but we've standardized within individual to control for cultural differences in how people use scales. 
And so what you can see on the left is that European Americans in red report that they wanna feel these excited states more than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts in blue, right? And then on the right, you see that the Hong Kong Chinese want to feel the, the calm states, the low arousal positive states more than their European American counterparts. Um, the Chinese Americans who are here in green are like their European American peers in that they value the excitement states as much um, and more than, uh, um, as much as European Americans, but more than their Hong Kong Chinese peers. And, but they're also like their Hong Kong Chinese peers in that they value the calm states more than European Americans. So these are differences that hold even when you control for differences in actual affect. So um, what's really interesting is we've actually found very few differences in how much people report actually feeling these states on average. And instead, it's really the differences in ideal affect that we find. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> it turned off for a second, right? Didn't it? Okay. It's like, did I just imagine? Okay. Um, so this is why in American context, in US American context, when people ask you, how are you, how are you feeling? What do you have to say? Great. No, fine is not good enough. You have to say great, right? And it's the reason why you're supposed to feel passionate about what you do, passionate about whom you love. People ask you, you know, are you having fun yet? These are all these high arousal positive states that are really valued in American context. Um, now, this is really old data. It was published in 2006. It was collected like in the early 2000s. And um, so you might be asking, well, what does it look like today? Well, we have just finished this huge sort of mega analysis of data that we've collected over decades and that other people have collected. And we find really consistently still today, it's the case that the European American samples are really valuing um, these excitement states more than their East Asian peers. And that's true for South Koreans and Japanese, Taiwanese, um, mainland Chinese. Um, the, the differences in the calm states sometimes emerge and sometimes they don't. And so that seems to be a little bit less stable, but the differences in the valuation of these excitement states really um, still um, hold. Okay, so this is now, so this is some early data and now tens of thousands of participants later, we really do still see these differences and how much people value these excitement states. Okay, so this really led to the development of this whole theoretical framework that we call affect valuation theory um, that begins to sort of answer this question of how does culture influence emotion. And so what we argue is that there are two components of emotion, at least, how people actually feel and then how they ideally want to feel. People really hadn't made that differentiation in the field, even though it might seem kind of obvious, right, that people don't always feel how they want to feel. But it was because a lot of the work was kind of done on in the same cultural context that people just assumed that everybody wanted to feel the same way. But once we started diversifying the samples, we showed that actually not everybody wants to feel the same way. Even though everybody wants to be happy, they're kind of defining them in different ways. And so the, the second part of affect valuation theory is that even though culture influences both actual and ideal affect, it might influence how we want to feel even more than how we actually feel. And this is what our data um, suggested then and have continued to suggest um, uh, years later. Okay, so, but this sort of wasn't enough. We wanted to, we wanted to really test this hypothesis that how people wanna feel is cultural. And so we wanted to think about, well, how do people learn to wanna feel a certain way, right? Um, for something to be cultural, it has to be socially transmitted. And so how do we learn about the states that we should ideally want to feel? So we started looking at, you know, one common source of socialization, media. So we did a series of studies where we looked at the emotional content of media in the United States versus various East Asian cultures. And our prediction was that we should find these differences in ideal affect in the widely distributed forms of media um, that people were exposed to. So we started with a series of studies looking at the best-selling storybooks in the United States and in Taiwan, and we coded um, the characters in all of the storybooks and whether or not they were um, showing big, broad excitement smiles or um, closed, calm smiles. And we found that um, in the best-selling U.S. storybooks, like Where the Wild Things Are, 
the characters were more likely to show these open toothy, big excitement smiles compared to, oops, compared to the characters in the best-selling storybooks in Taiwan. You, can, you, can, you can't even see the smile in this one here. So these are the calm smiles right here. And here's versus the big excitement smile. <laughs> It's funny, I'm going back and forth here. So you guys can over here can see this is a big, broad excitement smile. And this is a little calm smile. So um, the characters in the best-selling children's storybooks in the United States were more likely to have these characters who showed excitement, big, broad excitement smiles um, and fear calm smiles compared to this, the characters in the best-selling Taiwanese storybooks. Um, they also, the characters were more likely to be engaged in these high arousal activities like jumping and dancing. Um, compared to the characters in the best-selling Taiwanese storybooks. We also looked at um, the advertisements in um, U.S. and Chinese women's magazines. This is going to date, date the study, you can see here. <laughs> um, and again, the women in the, the models, it actually wasn't specific to women, in the faces in the best-selling um, U.S. women's magazines had more of these excitement smiles and fewer of these calm smiles than... Um, the people in the um, women's magazines in China and uh, Hong Kong. Um, we even looked at sort of the expressions and the activities that people are engaged in in their Facebook profiles. And we found that in the European American Facebook profiles, people showed again, these big, broad excitement smiles, and they're more likely to do these high arousal activities like jumping into a lake um, compared to um, their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts. And most recently, um, we even did a study looking at the expressions in leaders' official website photos. Um, we found that um, in the United States, um, American leaders are six times more likely to show these big, broad, toothy excitement smiles than their Chinese counterparts. And what's really funny is when we did this study, Biden and Xi Jinping were just vice presidents, <laughs> and now they're presidents. Um, but we found that these differences held regardless of um, the context. So this was true in, for government leaders, but it was also true for business leaders and university leaders that US leaders were six times more likely to show these excitement smiles than their Chinese counterparts. Um, so the idea is that um, advertisers and illustrators and um, publicists create these images that reflect the cultural ideal. And then we, as consumers of all of this media, are exposed to these ideals and we internalize them. We're not even aware of them. You know, we just like think, okay, that's an excitement, that's a happy smile, and that's a good leader. And um, so that's how it gets transmitted, and that's how, and then we re reproduce these differences. Okay, so at this point, you might be asking, well, why do these differences exist? Like, why do we see these differences between US um, and East Asian samples? I just wanna make sure I'm. In time. Okay. Um, and um, this is where the individualism collectivism response is spot on. So, what we argued or predicted was that in individualistic contexts like the United States, there's a real emphasis on influencing others, right? Uh, your goal in an individualistic context is to basically express your preferences and your desires and your attitudes. And that, and then to change your environment so they're consistent with how you want them to be, right? So um, I live in, um, I live on campus at Stanford, but in Palo Alto, right? And everybody's tearing down houses and making them how they want them to be. It's like a reflection of their internal state. That's a classic example of influencing your environment. And that's really valued in individualistic cultures. And what we predict is that when you're seeking to influence others in your environment that involves action like you have to do something you have to tear that that um, old house down and build a new one or if you're trying to influence another person you have to convince them and argue with them about why your opinion is the right one that requires action and action requires increases in arousal so if you come from a cultural context that's encouraging you to influence others then that makes you value these high arousal positive states in contrast, in many collect East Asian collectivistic contexts, the goal is really more to adjust to others, right? Because your the ideal or your goal is to really fulfill your obligations and expectations. 
And so in order to do that, that actually requires adjusting to other people, adjusting to your environments. In order to adjust to your environments, you have to attend to them. You have to know what's expected of you. And that requires actually decreases in arousal, right? Decreases in arousal will broaden your attention to your environmental context. So if you're trying to adjust to others, you need to suspend action, reduce arousal, um, at least in order to sort of assess, you know, what's expected of you, and then you can kind of act in kind. So in East Asian collectivistic context, when you're being encouraged to adjust more, that would then make you value these calm states more. And so through a series of studies, um, survey studies and experimental studies, we show these links between having an influence goal and valuing excitement and having an adjustment goal and valuing calm. And I'm happy to talk more about this um, um, at the end of the talk if you have any questions. But maybe I should actually stop here and ask you if you have any questions. Are there any questions that you have about anything that I've talked about so far? Oh, yes. I, yes. I was um, interested in your um, earlier study. And uh, I was thinking about the age, whether, you know, I, I wonder the age of the participants. Yes. Because um, our, our response to our happy state was very different. Uh, as Europe, two Europeans, right? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to say how it was different? Content, calm. <laughs> Content and calm, yes. Okay. So this is a great question. Are there age differences in how people ideally want to feel? And we had that same question as well. So the first studies were based on college students, but we've since done studies of people spanning the lifespan from 18 to 95, actually. And um, there is this real intuition that over time you would value calm states more. Um, in some of the early work, we didn't find that, but in this huge mega analysis that I just talked about with lots and lots of different samples, we do find an association between age and value and calm. So it increases the valuation of calm. Um, but in some of the early studies, we found that the European American older adults valued the excitement just as much as their European American counterparts. They expressed it differently, I think, but they valued it just as much. Um, and that the Hong Kong Chinese older adults that we studied actually showed like that uh, decrease in how much they valued both excitement and calm over time. It was like they were accepting kind of their, their how they were more and not trying to aspire to a different ideal. So, um, so that's a really good question. And um, and yes, there are there are some age differences. Are there any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Fascinating work. Um, I was thinking about the socialization of emotion. Yes. I'm a developmentalist. I was thinking yes. of difference, and I wanted yes. to had dipped your toe into that context. And then I was thinking about mental health and mm -hmm. how the implications might be for how we think about and self-assess our own states of happiness. Absolutely. In yes. So, Absolutely. Very interested. So um, when I talk to parents about this work, a lot of them start reflecting on the things that they say to their kids. And especially the European American parents realize that a lot of times, and this is what I, in, in a variety of texts, that when they ask their kids how they're doing, they say, um, did you have fun? Or can you tell me about something exciting that happened today? And I think that's how a lot of it gets socialized, you know, because what are you marking then? You're marking like that those are the events that are the good events and those are the events that you want here. I don't think the parents are doing that intentionally, right? That's just being part of the culture. And in other talks, what I like to do is show just I'm a, I'm a parent of two um, kids. Jen and I were talking about this. They're now 15 and 13. But when they were really little, you know, we would go to lots of birthday parties and the birthday parties were often happened at these places that have these bouncy houses. I don't know if you guys know what these bouncy houses were. Really what you do, the kids are just bouncing, 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 bouncing. And then they have cake at the end and they celebrate, right? And I think that that's a great example of it's these high arousal states that are being associated with reward, <laughs> you know, birthdays and cakes. Um, so I think there are lots of things in the environment, you know, of course, this is a certain um, SES, you know, context and, but that there are lots of practices, a lots of co um, conversational styles that, that reflect these high arousal positive states that other people have looked at. Um, we've only done a little bit of it. Um, we do find that these differences are replicated in preschool kids, just about the time when they develop sort of an understanding of emotion. So, so we see these differences very early on in, in development. 
Um, but we haven't done as many studies on uh, parental socialization as I'd love to do. And then um, hold on on the well being question because we'll get there. Okay. Okay. Yes. Is there any other demographics that you guys are interested in studying that isn't just U.S. Uh, New European Americans and East Asians that you think maybe would influence or even change the scope of this research? Um, other um, other cultures or other demographic variables? Yes, absolutely. So um, I knew this was going to be a question because it's a really good one. Um, it it really depends. The, the samples that we study largely depend on who's on the research team. So I know these cultures well. These are the cultures I know the best. And so that's where I started. But we have students in the lab. I have a Turkish student who is really studying ideal affect in Turkey and other Middle Eastern contexts. Um, when, um, when I've had different African-American students in the lab, they've studied African-American contexts. Um, we have some Latinx students. Um, so yes, but it depends on the people who are studying it. And they have a real, a, you know, a much deeper understanding of the culture than I do. And just as a field in general, I think we've done a good job broadening from European American or just Western context to East Asian. But really, Latinx is where everybody's going now because it's a collectivistic context, but doesn't really look like East Asian, right, as much. And so and then and Middle Eastern as well. So there's just, this is what I said, there's so much more to do and you guys could be the ones to do it. So I, I, um, it's really, really important and a really, really great question. You can also look at socioeconomic status, um, gender and the intersectionality of all of those things. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, all right, so one more question. Yes, and then I'll move on. Yes, please. So we talked, very good question. So the question is about age and gender, and we're just talking about intersectionality, which I think we could do much better of a job. You know, we're just sort of, we started, we were just trying to go beyond, you know, just look, can we go to another culture, please? And then we went to age and it, um, gender is so interesting because, um, we predicted that there would be more gender differences than we actually found when we measure actual and ideal affect at a global level. When we're just actually asking, you know, how much do you actually and how much do you ideally want to feel these states in general over the course of a typical week? Where we found more gender differences was more when we were measuring ideal affect in a particular situation. And that's where we found a little bit more, but there's so much more work to do. And those are only on binary. You know, we haven't done any work on non-binary. So that's another really important introduction. And then age, I sort of talked about earlier that we've done some work on younger kids, um, preschoolers, and some work at later stages of the lifespan. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. These are all great questions. Okay, so you might have asked the question, okay, but why do these differences matter? <laughs> so it's nice that there are these differences. Why do they matter? How do they play themselves out in the real world? I think this is like the most important reason to do research, right? Um, because you want them to have some sort of um, practical application to make the world a better place. And boy, do we have a lot of um, problems that we need to address. So we've done lots of studies trying to look at the manifestations of these differences in ideal affect um, in everyday life. And I should say that even though I'm talking about culture, we found many individual differences within cultural groups, because obviously there, there are many individual differences. Um, um, so, um, but I'm just gonna talk about the cultural ones. Um, and if you have more questions about individual differences, please let me know. So there've been lots, we've done lots of studies to look at these manifestations. And we found that these cultural differences in ideal affect matter for a lot of things. They matter for what we purchase, for how we exercise, um, for how we view well-being, right? So you can see when you ask people to define happiness, to define health, that they're producing results that are consistent with their culture's ideal affect. And that when they talk about distress or depression even, it's the opposite of their ideal affect. So that means there are lots of cultural and ethnic differences in the emotions that people associate with well-being and with emotional distress. They influenced how we view romantic love. 
people who value excitement states more and cultures that value excitement states more really think of the ideal and being in terms of passion, right? Um, and, but if they value calm states more, they seem to value, think of uh, romantic love in terms of more companionate forms of love. This is work that uh, Julie Kasia in my lab is, is actively working on. She presented at this conference that we were just at. And they influence even what we think about old age. So we talked about age differences, but what we find is that the more you value an ex excitement, the more you dread old age because you know that old age is associated with increases in low arousal. So if you think that you, if you value excitement, excitement states, you're more likely to dread old age. But if you value them less, you're more likely to look forward to old age. Um, so the, the, just some examples, and the more you value excitement states, the more you prefer running uh, to walking. Um, the more when we give you different consumer products, the more likely if you value excitement states more, you're more likely to choose stimulating products than more soothing products. Um, and then this is the example of the old age that if you uh, value excitement, then you dread old age. Um, but the less you value excitement, the more you look forward to it. Okay, so our most recent work has really looked at, um, focused on sort of the interpersonal consequences. So I kind of talked about the individual consequences of these differences in ideal affect. And I would say in the last um, like five to eight years, we've been focused more on how these differences in ideal affect influence how we judge other people and how we treat them. And the idea here is that when there's a match between your ideal affect and the, per, and the emotion of the person that you're meeting, you'll judge them more positively, right? So when I meet Jen for the first time, and I value excitement. She shows me this big, broad excitement smile. I just like her immediately. Um, I think she's friendly and she's warm and I want to talk to her more. And that's partly about Jen. She is warm and friendly and all those things. But it's partly about me too, that I value excitement states. And so she's showing the excitement states that I value. So that was the hypothesis. And, um, and that's really what we found. And I'll tell you about it in just a second, that these cultural differences in ideal ethic matter for whom we see as friendly and then subsequently who we befriend. And that that then has implications for who we share resources with, like who we're willing to approach and who we give more of our resources to, um, whom we hire and even whom we choose to lead. So um, in these studies, we, we do, the, this is sort of what we do. We show people, European Americans and Hong Kong Chinese are, are different groups, a variety of faces that vary in terms of their race. So they're white and Asian and their gen, uh, sex, male and female. And, and most importantly, their emotional expressions. So they might be excite, exciting or uh, more calm. Um, and here's the, the white faces. You can see that these are computer generated faces. We also show real faces. Um, and we essentially find a consistency across all the different kinds of stimuli, the, uh, facial stimuli that we use. Um, we basically ask people to look at these faces and we say, how, warm and friendly and extroverted are the are they we also ask about how competent they are so how intelligent and competent and then also how assertive they are dominant and um, assertive and what we find is that the european americans here in red um, rate the excited faces as more friendly compared to the hong kong chinese in blue so those are the two bars on the left um, but they also um, and, and that these differences are really due to how much they value excitement states. So it's, um, th that's what the difference is. So what you can see is that both groups see the excited smiles, and regardless of um, whether it's computer generated or a real face, as, as more friendly than the calm face, right? You see that for both groups, but the difference is really greater for the European Americans. And that difference really is due to how much they value these excited states. Now, what's interesting is that these differences hold regardless of the race of the target, whether they're white or Asian, or, and the sex of the, um, of the face, if they're male or female. So really what seems to matter is the emotional expression that the person's showing. And the other interesting thing is that it matters really for these ratings of what we call affiliation, how warm and friendly, how trustworthy these spaces are. We don't really find that the cultural differences in ideal ethic matter for how competent you report somebody being or how assertive. 
But this is important because we know from decades of research in personality and social psychology that one of the most important judgments we make about other people is the affiliation judgment, right? You meet somebody for the first time, it's a stranger. And the first thing you, I like them, I don't. They're trustworthy or they're not. They're warm or they're not. And that has all sorts of implications, right? Because like I said, it determines whether you're going to approach them and keep talking to them or if you're going to avoid them, withdraw and go seek somebody else. And so what we think these data are kind of suggesting is that people are using emotional expression and, and more specifically ideal affect match as a signal of in-group, you know, and they're, they're probably not even doing it. Um, they're probably not even aware of it, right? That they're using people's emotional expressions and whether or not they match their ideal um, as a way of determining whether or not they are, are, are gonna be friend or foe. Okay. So let me show you why this matters. Like I said, they have implicate. This has implications for how we treat people. So we've done a series of studies on this, but I'm just going to tell you about one where we. This is led by Bo Kang Park, where we basically have participants play different behavioral economic games, where we give them a certain amount of money, and then we just ask them, "How much money will you give to this receiver?" So we give them $10 or $14. In this case, it actually doesn't matter what amount we give them. And we just show them a face that varies in terms of race, sex, and emotional expression. And we just ask them, how much do you give to them? And, and the target has to receive it. So it, um, this is really a measure of charitable giving. And what we find is that the European Americans give more to these excited um, recipients um, compared to the calm ones. And they give more than the, um, in this case, South Koreans do. So, and it, again, it doesn't actually matter here. I'm gonna just show you the breakdown um, for the faces that are white um, or Asian and male or female, you see the same pattern. So it's really the cultural difference that is really striking and um, that the European Americans are really giving more to the excited recipients um, compared to the Hong Kong, sorry, sorry the Koreans. Um, the Koreans give slightly more to the, the calm targets. And um, to see whether or not that this really translates into real life, we did this study um, in collaboration with Kiva. How many of you have heard about Kiva? It's a micro lending platform that basically allows people to determine who they want to give money to. Like they have just, it gets rid of a middle person, right? And so in Kiva, if you're a lender, you want to share money with someone, you basically look at the different profiles of various borrowers and the borrowers have a picture of themselves. So we had this huge database where we could basically look at the different countries of, and, of, and take lenders from each one of these different countries and then look at the profiles of the people that they actually gave money to. So we had ideal affect data on 11 different nations, uh, you can see here. And um, then we basically took lenders from these 11 different nations, which, which sample different East Asian and Western contexts. And we also, I think, have Mexico in here as well. And then we took the, so we took a sample of lenders from each of these countries. And then we looked at the people that they gave money to and um, coded the facial expressions of the borrowers that they gave money to. So this shows you, these are two profiles and there's the excitement profile, an excited profile on the left and a calm profile on the right. And then on the bottom, you see these data that um, when we looked at this, we found that when the lenders were from countries that valued excitement states, they were more likely to have given money to borrowers who had excitement expressions in their profile. And they were less likely to have given to borrowers who had calm expressions in their profiles. So this is really an illustration of how these differences in ideal affect play themselves out in the real world in terms of lending and sh uh, sharing resources. Okay, um, I'm almost done because I know we wanna talk. We've done other studies um, where we've presented different um, applicants um, who are applying for a job. So these are actually video clips. We did this um, for a US sample and a Hong Kong Chinese sample. So. The U.S. sample saw the top row of applicants. The Hong Kong sample saw the bottom row, and they basically, um, you know, were equally qualified. But what differed is the emotions that they were showing. And we asked then the participants, European Americans and Hong Kong Chinese, to choose which candidate they wanted to hire for an internship. And what we found was that the European American 
European Americans were more likely to choose the excited applicants than the Hong Kong Chinese, and the Hong Kong Chinese were more likely to choose the calm applicants. So this is controlling, again, they all had similar um, qualifications, but it shows how, again, that these differences in ideal affect, you know, have important consequences for things like employment. And so we know that, um, that uh, minority applicants are less likely to be, hire, be hired than majority applicants, even when they're equally qualified. And what we think is that these differences in ideal affect might be one of many reasons why this might be the case. Um, we've also done studies looking at leadership, like who you choose to lead in more sort of local contexts, like student organizations, and we find these similar patterns of results. And so this obviously has consequences for things like the bamboo ceiling, which many of you have probably heard about, which is um, just a description of the fact that many East Asian Americans are quite qualified for leadership positions, but they are severely underrepresented in um, top leadership positions. And this might be one reason why. And again, it's not necessarily intentional, but um, you know, people, you hear people say, well, we'd love to have an Asian American who could lead, um, uh, but they just don't have you know, what it takes to lead. And so the question is, well, where does that come from? What it takes to lead, we'd argue is that's, a, that's cultural, right? And so if you're, if you're not aware of how you're using your cultural ideals when you're choosing candidates or leaders, then you might le be leaving a lot of talent on the table. And that's, I think, uh, what happens in many multicultural societies like the United States. Okay. So what are some of the current things that we're doing? Um, we wanna look at the conditions under which ideal affect uh, match matters most. So ideal affect is just one of many influences on people's decisions. So what are the conditions under which it matters more than other times? So in some of our studies looking at leadership choice, we find that um, it's really during times of growth when people are using heuristics to make their decisions that that's when they're more likely to use their ideal affect um, in choosing leaders, but in times of crisis, you know, when people are sort of rethinking, you know, their choices, they're more likely to go to non-prototypical leaders. And that's true when you think about emotion too, they're less likely to use their ideal ethic when they're making their choices. We've done other studies where we have people kind of deliberate a little bit more, like really think about your choice. And there you see that European Americans then don't prefer excited candidates. So these are some of the moderators of the effect that we've been looking at. We've been also interested in how these cultural differences in ideal affect influence other ways of expressing emotion. We're doing a lot of studies right now looking at social media and the kind of affect that goes viral and whether or not that varies across cultures. And we've, we've got some data that suggests that it does. Um, how have these cultural differences in ideal affect changed over time? Um, so in this huge mega analysis that I talked about, we're finding that people are sort of valuing negative states more um, over the years since when we first started collecting the data. And there's some really interesting things that we could talk about about why that might be the case. Um, what about other ethnicities and other cultures, um, other emotions? There's just so much more work that we could do that we talked about earlier. And then as we said, it's really important to look at intersectionality, like how these things interact with each other, particularly in particular situations. So in summary, um, cultural factors influence how we wanna feel even more than how we actually feel. And a North American context, value excitement states and high arousal positive states more than many East Asian contexts. These differences in ideal affect have important personal consequences that I talked about, like what we do, what we choose, how we define happiness and love, even how we view old age. But they also have really important interpersonal consequences for how we treat other people. First, how we judge people and how we treat them. And this can actually lead to unintentional racial disparities and ethnic disparities and discrimination in multicultural societies like ours. So to end, I just wanna thank all of the members of the Culture and Emotion Lab. This isn't even all of them. Um, our funding agencies, including the National Science Foundation, which is run our third grant from them. So we couldn't do it without them. And I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. So we've got like 20 minutes for questions and um, I'd be happy to answer any of them. They've all been so good. 
this one. Yes. Uh, is that a couple of clarifying questions? Sure. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the question of like depression on them is operating sort of opposite depending on your ideal ethic. Were you referring to opposite uh, on both dimensions of that deal or just a single like the scale or just Really good question. Okay. So I said it really quickly. Um, we've been really interested in the clinical implications of these differences in ideal affects. So there's a whole series of studies that we've done, including one where we ask people to um, identify the emotions that they associate with happiness, well-being, as well as the emotions that they identify with um, feeling depressed and emotional distress. And um, what we predicted I don't know if I can even get to this, it was at the very beginning, was that people's ideal affect would influence the emotional, would be associated with the emotional states that they associated with um, happiness and well-being. I think I'm almost there. Oops, sorry. This is like the whole talk. Okay. <laughs> right there. It's the third slide. Okay. So that um, if you value excitement states more and in uh, European American context, when you talk about happiness and well-being, you would see more of these excitement states. But when you talk about depression or distress, it would be the opposite of these high arousal positive states, which are these lower arousal negative states, feeling dull or sluggish. And this is what we found in people's open-ended responses, um, as well as the emotions that they picked. Same thing for the Hong Kong Chinese. They talked about happiness more in terms of these low arousal positive states, but when they talked about distress, it was the opposite of those low arousal positive states. So they talked more about fearfulness and hostility, anxiety, these high arousal negative states. What's really interesting is that we were then wanting to look at how we as clinicians and scientists actually measure well-being and depression, right? Because there's so many inventories out there that we use for both research and clinical purposes. Most of them were um, developed in the United States or in Western contexts. So we took each of the items, like each question in popular inventories used to measure well-being and depression. And we just coded it. Um, like what emotion did they mention and what we coded it using this um, affective circumplex. And what we found was that the well, the most popular well-being measures oversample the high arousal positive states. They rarely have these low arousal positive states. And even the measures of depression, um, because they were talking about you know, the absence of positive emotion, tend to um, define positivity in terms of these high arousal positive states, which means that even when we're assessing well-being and depression, right, we're using kind of a Western value. And um, that's, or it's fine to use those in cultures or samples that value excitement states primarily, but you're missing a huge slice of emotional life if you're, um, for, for samples that value um, since then, people have um, created, Barb Fredrickson and her class, she might have, I don't know if she talked about it, but they created a, a um, peacefulness of mind scale. So they're trying to develop well-being inventories that sample more of these low arousal positive states. That's much more than you asked for, but, <laughs> but those are the studies that, that we're really interested in. We've also done some studies with clinicians in training because you know, clinicians in training are trying to assess how depressed somebody is. And we, we show that... Um, without any kind of instruction, people are basically using this excitement ideal. Like the more, the less excitement people show, the more depressed they think the, the target is. But then if you tell the clinicians in training that there are both cultural and individual differences in, in people's happiness, and some people value excitement states and some people calm states, then they're less likely to use the absence of excitement as the measure of depression. So it's really to, to look at sort of what are all these clinical implications of these differences, because of course, clinicians like scientists, like all of us are products of our culture. Great. Yes. Uh-huh. And then they kind of talk themselves out of it and went back to, well, maybe we do prefer the low arousal kind of side of it. Did that happen on the other side as well, where they, after they deliberated, they kind of came around and said, you know, we do enjoy the, the more excited African Um, So this is a good question about the deliberation. Again, I talked about it really quickly. Um, we've looked at deliberation in the context of these be behavioral economic games where we just have people engage in some sort of task that is either more difficult or less difficult before they play these economic games. So when it's more difficult, it's like they have less time to deliberate. 
and they're more likely to then give European Americans to give to the excited candidate, the, sorry, the excited targets in these behavioral economic games. But when you give them something that's like less cognitively taxing, they've more time to, you know, kind of deliberate, then they actually give equally to the excited and the calm targets. We haven't really looked at it in the ways that you described it. It's just really about, you know, giving people a little bit more time before they play this behavioral economic game. But it's it's made us start thinking about other aspects of culture as well, which is, you know, when you deliberate, we, we sort of have this idea that if you deliberate, then um, you won't be as biased in whatever decision that you make, right? That, I think that's what we sort of think a little bit as a field, but it kind of depends what you're deliberating about, right? And I think in American context, what we're finding is that people are deliberating more about egalitarianism, right? We, we have that as a goal, at least, even though we don't act on it all the time. So I think what the European Americans are doing is they're realizing like, oh, I don't know who these people are. It's just an excited or calm expression. I should just give equally to people. But what's interesting is that when we have our Taiwanese and our Hong Kong Chinese participants deliberate, they still give more to the calm targets and the excited targets like they they just so it's like they because they don't have the egalitarian ideal they value i think hierarchy a little bit more and so they they're deliberating about something else at least and they still give you know to the to the calm target more so th those are the line um I maybe give you more of a sense of what we mean by deliberation yeah are there other questions or uh, can I maybe somebody who I haven't called on before? Yeah, yes. Um, were any of the subjects adoptees, or would that have an effect on the measure or outcome? And tell me more what you're thinking. Well, to say that, like, um, I'll provide some like personal context. Like, mm -hmm. I grew up in a like, household where yeah. I wasn't exposed to my Asian culture as perhaps someone who was. Uh, like a Hong Kong immigrants and Hong Kong parents. Right. Would that change that in the outcome, or does that play more towards American culture? What do you think? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to say that I think that it, uh, it changes a lot, I, I looked at the um, high, what was it? Low LAP, the, yeah, low arousal positive uh -huh. yeah, for uh, Americans, where they seem it, it was almost like a side effect of like trying to fit in with the culture in that, in that sense, where Are, it almost uh bounded so far to the other side, where it's almost compensating for what they didn't experience. Yes, it's really. Very good observation. So this is, I think, these data right here, where you're noticing that the Chinese Americans in green are like valuing the calm states even more than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts. Okay, so your question is a really good one. I didn't have time to talk about this early on when people, and still I guess it's kind of true in cultural psychology, that there isn't that, I, I really felt like people didn't really do a very good job of operationalizing culture. Right, because like I said, there's so many individual differences. There's so much variation. So in all of our studies, I just didn't have time to talk about it. We administer um, a measure that we created called the General Ethnicity Questionnaire, which is really looking at people's orientation to various cultures so that we could really capture that variation. And I think that's what you're describing when you talk about adoptees or anybody, right, who sort of varies. The idea in cult of, of culture is that we have this dominant model that we're all influenced by in some way, but we can react to it in different ways. We might really actively endorse it, not even question it, or we might really react to it. And um, so we wanted to capture that by measuring these individual differences in cultural orientation. And, and we do find that the people who are more oriented to American culture are the ones that value the excitement states more of Chinese Americans. And, and the other um, Asian American groups that we studied. We also really use different cultural criteria in our samples. So we don't assume that everybody's the same. So we look at people you know, who were raised in a certain uh, household where a certain dialect was spoken. Um, we look at the majority of their friends. And so again, understanding that there's a lot of variation and in the early studies, just trying to get people who we thought would really vary more. Um, this is really interesting because 
we found this in two studies now, and actually in this large meta-analysis, we still find that the East Asian Americans are valuing the calm states even more than their East Asian counterparts. And I think like you were implying, you know, there are lots of reasons why might, this might be the case. These Americans are first and second generation. Right. And for, for the most part, a lot of their parents came to the United States and had been in the United States for at least 10, usually more 20 years. So I think probably many of you are familiar with these ideas that then these Chinese Americans are kind of raised in a household in the United States where, where sort of Chinese culture was kind of frozen in time. It was a little bit more traditional, you know, than the culture that their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts were engaged in, which is much more uh, dynamic. So that might be why they're they're even kind of more Chinese than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts because because of what they were exposed to by their parents. So it's really, you know, getting at this idea that I think you're implying, which is that culture is complex and there's a lot of variation. And we've tried to look at that um, in our work um, uh, to, to really get at that variation. Any other questions or? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I feel that these... Uh method and learned by the political science students or someone interesting to run public officer if uh, they go to for example if i want to run a councilwoman in my district yes I go to american uh, fundraising and i'm a you should show more excitement yeah yeah and that's my <laughs> my personality but when i go to a uh, chinese church when i go to a korea church yes i have to change a different space yes yes um, so you're doing what a lot of people talk about as code switching, but instead of a, a differences in language, it's differences in emotional expression. And there's a lot of uh, research on that, you know, sort of switching depending on the context in, that you're in. I have to admit that we've done some of those studies on emotion, and it's not as clear cut as we thought it would be, because we thought there's there's some work looking at sort of cognitive, you know, the, the way in which you process information. You might do it in a more Chinese way or a more American way, and they sort of show this is uh, Veronica Benny Martinez and Ying Yi Hong and C.Y. Chu's work and Michael Morris's work. So we thought it would work the same way with emotion along the lines that you just described, but it seems like it's a little bit more complicated than that. So we, we still have more work to do. Um, yeah. Yes. But in terms of like the study, if you wanted to add like another variable, uh -huh. what's time to break down and add it's like the kind of study like if you want to let's inquire about like a common family versus not a common family versus like how much would that like add to that? So the question is, if you want to add some other variable or factor, how much time does that add to it? Well, first I have to tell you, research takes a long time. <laughs> research takes a really long time. Well, good research takes a really long time. And um, so, um, you know, it, it, it means, so, you know, you have to sort of spend the time thinking about what your hypotheses are about how that variable might might make a difference. And then you have to think about what we usually do is we try to just collect some easy data, you know, just to sort of see, is there evidence that that whatever proposed um, relationship is there? And then we kind of do like the next step of like a more carefully controlled kind of study, you know, um, so we do like a series in all of our papers, we have like two or three studies, you know, um, to try to make sure that we really have something there. So it takes a long time, I would say, but not too long to do it, you know, if you're really committed to it. And um, yeah, I, I think I think all of the work requires somebody who's really driven or a team of people really driven, you know, to to find the answer to the question. And then it, it um, it takes a lot of time, but it's not impossible. Is that does that answer your? I know it's kind of vague, but it sort of depends on what you're specifically interested in studying, and it's because of people's interest. When people come into my lab, especially as graduate students, they always come in with an interest um, in contributing to the existing work, and that's what I always want them to do. So that they kind of learn how we approach things and how we do things. But they always have something that they're really interested in. 
you know, one of my first students, she was interested in health decision making. So we have a whole bunch of studies on showing, you know, how ideal affect plays itself out in physician patient interactions. Another person was really interested in negative emotions. You know, she came from Germany and she just thought like Americans are just so superficial. <laughs> and so she did all of these studies looking at um, the degree to which European Americans and Germans want to, how, how accepting of negative emotion they are. And she, she looked at sort of how, the consequences that has for how we express sympathy to other people. And that all came from Birgit, um, who just got tenure at Santa Clara University. And so everybody who comes into the lab, Julie was really interested in romantic love and how this, so it's like, if you come in with a burning question, then sure it takes time, but it's kind of worth it to you. To, and, and you bring in, I wouldn't have done any of that work if it hadn't been for the students. And I, I recently had to write this chapter that kind of describes like all of the work over time. And, and for me, I, I just realized how much it matters who you're doing the research with. Like the projects and the people are inseparable because so many of their ideas and the things that we're studying come from them and their experiences. So a lot of time, but not, not an impossible amount of time. <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing. And I just think it's so exciting that when you listen to someone else's research, it, as you're saying, in parallel, students, faculty, all of us, it makes us think of other questions. And yes. Points us in directions as we're passionate about and want to learn more about. I just wanted to throw out two questions. As yes, an example please. That your work made me think of. Number one was all of the fascinating work on babies and how yes. early on Absolutely. babies are showing preferences for helpers and such. And so I was yeah. thinking, do babies so a pro show yes. a preference for, well, European American babies and perhaps babies of other cultural backgrounds show preferences for this excited open expression versus the more serene expression. And then also living as an introvert in an extroverted world. Yes. I don't know if that's too much individual difference. Yeah. But collectivistic, individualistic, introversion, extroversion. Yes. Just many, many yeah. implications good, for interesting. Yeah, really good questions. So um, in, in the culture and emotion field, I mean, what I like to say is that it's always important to, to rule out alternative hypotheses, right? It's really important. As a developmental psychologist, you know that one of the biggest alternative hypotheses is temperament, right? Sort of these biological predispositions. And when we talk about cultural differences in emotion, that's what people always want to know. Well, how do you know that these aren't due, these are not just temperamental uh, differences? And actually, in all of our studies with kids, we actually measure the temperament of the kids either through teachers' reports or through the parent reports. And we find that they don't account for the differences in the preferences that our kids show. It, we can't, for the, for the kids' studies, the preschooler studies, we can't give them our self report questionnaire of ideal affects. So we do things like we show them an excited smiley face and a calm smiley face, and we say, which one do you prefer to be? Which one do you think is more happy? Or we give them like a big green piece of construction paper, and then we give them the choices of different things that they can put in their ideal playground. And so the choices are between a more exciting and a, a more calming, you know, kind of activity. And we do find that the European American preschoolers are more likely to um, say that the excited smile is happier and to choose more of these sort of exciting options in their ideal playground compared to their Taiwanese counterparts, and that those aren't due to temperament. So that's for temperament for the kids. For the adults, we do measure extroversion and eroticism, which are sort of like some people think of as more adult versions of temperament. And, and we find that the, those individual difference merit variables account more for how much people are actually feeling excitement and how much they're actually feeling anxiety, the high arousal positive and the high arousal negative states, and um, um, less about their ideals. Yeah. So, it, you know, I didn't tell you about all the theory because I didn't have time, but what we predict is that culture influences how we want to feel more than how we actually feel, but temperament probably influences how we actually feel even more than how we ideally want to feel. And then the baby's question is, you know, I early on I did these studies with babies. It's not really babies, it's people's reactions to babies because I had a colleague who you know, when we had our babies, they, she'd like throw the baby up in the air. You know, it was like this, really this excitement, or you could see how hard people work to get kids to smile or something or to, and then um, also, you know, like people gave us like lots of different things and like the, the jumper, you know, had all of these like, like animals making these noises, like, Aah! 
Ah! You know, like all this. And I didn't understand. Why was my daughter making these noises all the time? It was because it was on the jumper. So I do, I do think that infants are shaped by all of those things and that you should be able to see them. Um, what I was reminded by when you were asking your question is the early work you probably know by Cottle and Weinstein, you know, where they compared U.S. and Japanese infants and they showed how parents, Japanese parents were much more soothing to the infants than, um, than the European American parents were. So they didn't really look at the infants, but you can imagine that with all of those things early on that they, that somehow you might be able to see a difference in what the infants are, are preferring. Cause you know, in Chinese context and time, like Taiwanese context, you're not throwing babies up in the air. That just doesn't, <laughs> that really doesn't happen. So yeah, right. Yes. Are there any other uh, questions? Yes, I know there was, sorry, there was, uh, there were two questions here. So yes, please. Um, I was wondering like if there were any similar studies that uh, will like, it does highlight European versus a uh, European American versus East Asians. Uh -huh. Asians. Yes. I was wondering if this is more expansive within expansive studies within the Asian community highlighting South Asia and South Asia. Yes, Asians. yes. So not in our work, there should be more, but more and more. Um, so for example, there's work by Jackson Liu, which was arguing that you don't see the bamboo ceiling for South Asians, you know, so he's showing, and, and he argues that in um, South Asian communities, there's more of a value placed on assertiveness than in East Asian communities. And so if that's the case, maybe you would see there, there would be a greater valuation of excitement states if um, in South Asian communities, Community, so that's a hypothesis that we're really eager to test. Test. The Latin X samples, and say, and and there, you know, the differences in collectivism really matter. So we associate sort of this value placed on adjustment with the valuation of calm states. But what if you're from a collectivistic culture where the primary goal isn't adjustment, you know, it's more interconnectedness, then I think that you would see a different kind of ideal affect. And so some work by Carl Falk and others has shown that the Latin, sort of the Mexican samples that he's looked at value the excitements, even though they're more collectivistic, they value the excitement states as much as Europeans do. So there's some of that work, but like I said, we, we need much more. In Middle Eastern contexts, and there, um, I've had different uh, um, students who are interested in African-American samples and communities. They found far fewer differences from European-Americans than they thought that they would find. Um, so yes, on, on many, many more, looking at nuances within these, you know, within these groups, but um, also expanding is really important. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think that means we're done. Yes. Get to 430 classes. Yes. Okay. But I would very much like to thank Dr. Sai for her time. And yeah. Thank you so much for coming and for all these questions. Yes.